Uh, I'll give you a quick background where I'm coming from and what I do in my everyday life because I think that will, uh, you know, settle down a lot of curiosities uh, that might be present in the room. So my name is uh, Sharad Vivek Sagar as I was introduced. Uh, I did not have regular schooling for the first 12 years of my life. I grew up in small towns and villages of Bihar and uh, my parents uh, taught me in three very interesting ways. Uh, today everybody is talking about you know innovation and education. My parents found three ways of educating us. My father who in his student days would go to the Ramakrishna Mission library to study, uh, he was very inspired by Swami Vivekananda. So when he was a student, he had this inspiration one day that either he is going to become a monk in the order of Sri Ramakrishna or name his kids after Swami Vivekananda. So clearly after several years my brother happened and I, so we were named you know Basant Vivek Sagar, Sharad Vivek Sagar, where Vivek comes from Swami Vivekananda, Sagar from Ishwachar Vidya Sagar, Basant and Sharad because we were born in Basant Ritu and Sharad Ritu. So it is <laughs> as simple as that. So the first part of our education was that our parents made it mandatory, small rented houses that we lived in, in small towns and villages of Bihar. My parents pasted quotations and teachings of uh, Thakurma and Swamiji, Sri Ramakrishna Dev, Holy Mother Sharada Devi and Swami Vivekananda on the four walls uh, where we lived. And every morning we woke up, the first thing we were supposed to do was you know, run around the house, walk around the house, whatever way, but read out those quotations aloud and only then get to work. So that is something that I've done for a long period of time. So if I'm able to, you know, repeat a Swamiji quote, that means, you know, that is retained memory from like 15 years ago or 20 years ago. But uh, this was the first way we were educated. Uh, my father, you know, every Sunday he was posted in further rural areas. So many times, he had to be in bank uh, from Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, he would try and teach us and he would, you know, sit down with books of Swamiji and we had to underline and we had to read to him. Many times he told us something very simple that when you're reading Swami Vivekananda, even when you cannot understand it, underline it. You'll come back to it and you'll have a new meaning out of it at some point. But that's the first part of my education. The second part of my education was uh, very simple. Parents decided to make it mandatory for us to read newspapers. So every day we had to read newspapers and in the parts of the state where I grew up, newspapers used to come one day late. But that would go on to play another significant role in what I do in my everyday life. And the third part was, you know, they would buy textbooks and notebooks, they would bring it home. Me, my brother, my sister, uh, the three of us, we would, you know, self-teach ourselves, our parents would teach us. So this is essentially what was happening. Long story short, I have some relation uh, ship with technology in general. I am a PCM student uh, who chose to study international relations uh, for undergraduate. So I lost track. But my brother went to MIT Boston uh, on a full scholarship uh, when he was, uh, you know, finishing high school. So he was an MIT undergrad. So a little bit of technology, I'm still, you know, somewhere in the room. I fit somehow. But uh, so a sister went to Columbia, brother went to MIT. I had the great honor of, you know, going to Tufts and Harvard and, uh, you know, finish my degrees and come back. In between, there was something very significant that was happening in my life. One was reading Swamiji. Some messages were clear in my mind. Swami Vivekananda oftentimes talks about, you know, uh, like he's oftentimes quoted that he talked about 100 good people and uh, one could transform the world. As a child growing up, I wanted to be one of those 100. Uh, everything that I saw in the newspaper, I would see, you know, some kid who represented India at an international competition. I would read about some student who received a full scholarship to study at a uh, Stanford or an MIT or a Harvard and uh, I would see some kid who won an international competition for India and I wanted to be that kid. I wanted to participate in these competitions, receive those scholarships, represent India at global platforms but I could not do any of these things because I was not enrolled in a school. So I picked up a very simple habit. Every time in the newspaper I would read about you know some kid achieving something. I would write down the name of the competition, the name of the scholarship, the name of the conference, the month in which the news article came out and who can participate and how, whatever little information I could gather from the newspaper. Now I continued this habit uh, for a decently long period of time till the age of 12 when you know um, my family had to move to the capital city of Patna. Uh, my two siblings and I, we moved with our mother and uh, we started going to a school. Once we started going to a school, I started participating in all of these competitions. And by the time I was finishing high school, I 
won close to 200 different uh, local, national and international competitions, represented India in over six different countries. And, you know, people around me kind of celebrated me that, okay, here's a good kid who can win competitions, do well in school and, you know, represent India abroad. But at the same time, when I went to these global platforms, I think the founding moment for dexterity was arriving. And it was very simple. Young people who represented India at these global platforms did not come from a background like mine. They went to, you know, ex extremely expensive institutions like, you know, the Dune School or Dhirubhai Ambani School, like extremely, extremely, uh, uh, I don't know if I can use the word selective, but definitely the top 0.0001% people are able to send their kids to these institutions. And I saw that at these global platforms, the people who were, the young people who were representing India, uh, they were hardworking and talented and meritorious and whatnot. But many times the conversations that were happening at global platforms were about, you know, access to clean drinking water, impact of, you know, uh, electricity supply in lives of, you know, a young person, X, Y, Z, whatever. And many times I felt that while these students are hardworking and talented and they care, most of their vision of what it looks like and what it can look like is coming through, you know, a lot of research through Google and other platforms, other ways. And I oftentimes felt if we wanted to have a conversation about, you know, access to clean drinking water, a girl child somewhere in, you know, a small village of Rajasthan who has seen her mother go a kilometer and a half to fetch a bucket of water, her presence at that platform can be so much more powerful and enriching and inspiring. And I wondered why these kids were not there. I also wondered if, you know, leadership in our society is going to be paratrooped long enough that somebody from Massachusetts will come and solve the problem of Maharashtra and somebody from Maharashtra will come and solve the problem of Muzaffarpur, uh, a district in my home state. We needed leadership bottom up. If we really cared, we need to, you know, activate our young people who are as talented, who care as much, who are willing to work as hard. We need to activate those kids bottom up. And that was, you know, uh, the founding idea for dexterity. And there were two things that I felt that other people who went to school with me or who, you know, uh, lived in small towns and districts of Bihar kind of lacked. And that was when I would come back, I would tell my friends, grade nine, grade 10 student, I would tell my friends, you know, this is the hotel where we stayed in, in Tokyo. These were the flights were, you know, this big, this who happened, that happened. I would also tell them, you know, ideas that people put forward, questions that were asked. And many times my friends knew an answer to a question everybody missed out at a national or a global platform. Many times they had ideas that were a lot brighter and a lot more practical than any uh, ideas put forward by young people at these platforms. And I would tell them that you should have been there, you should have participated, only to figure out that all these years of, you know, writing down from newspapers what activities take place in what month, who can participate and how, I knew that these opportunities existed. My young friends did not know that these opportunities even exist. And that is the reason why in 2008, Dexterity was founded with a uh, twin goal. The first part was, if there is an educational opportunity that is specially designed for our children and youth, they should be the first ones to know about it. The second one was that while we are going to connect majority of our young people with educational opportunities, we also understand that for many kids in our country, giving the example of one President Kalam is not enough, one Kalpana Chawla is not enough. For our kids, President Kalam, Sachin Tendulkar, Kalpana Chawla are one in a billion fairy tale stories that happen, you know, once in a century. Not every kid can be Kalam, not every kid can be Kalpana Chawla. That is what many of our young people do feel, disconnected with resources, disconnected from opportunities. And for that reason, Dexterity strongly believes in the concept of local role models. And we felt in 2008 and 14 years, 15 years down the lane, we've begun to see the impact that it has. We believed that we need to build that young leader, that child in a small district or a remote village, the first girl child to go to college on a full scholarship, the first child to start something of his or her own. That these are young people who raise the levels of access and aspiration and achievement in these communities. So 14 years ago, that is what we started doing. 14 years later today, our kids have received more than 113 crores in scholarships from top institutions across the world. More than seven to eight million uh, kids on the first Sunday of every month are connected with educational opportunities that range from, you know, making an app to making a stamp. Uh, all kinds of opportunities that young people can, you know, uh, participate in. 
But more importantly, these young people are trained with Swamiji's ideas. These young people are trained to be servant leaders. And the simple idea of leadership, the simple definition of leadership we give our young people within the dexterity system is that leadership is your ability to deliver value to whatever limited expertise you have. The value that you deliver is how you're being useful to the society, friends, family, or you know, your country or locality, whatever it is. The expertise part is exactly where education comes in. So we tell our young kids that, you know, it is not the optics of television or social media or the world outside that defines that, you know, who leaders are. It is the delivery at, you know, uh, in, in the real moment. And that essentially qualifies a five-year-old child who does not know, you know, how to write very well or read very well. But if that child knows how to walk and helps a three-year-old child walk, that child is a leader. When that child is 15 years of age, that child might not know, you know, decent enough coding like many of you do or, uh, you know, how to craft a policy or build a think tank. But if that child knows how to write good English or Hindi or Bangla or Telugu or Kannada, whatever language it might be, if that child decides to write a letter for an old woman, uh, an old grandmother to get a widow pension card, that child is a leader. It is these same kids who, you know, go forward at five, your skill is walking, you help somebody else walk. At 15, your skill is writing, you write a letter for somebody. At 25, it can be, you know, uh, coding to build something better, writing policies or working in a think tank to make, you know, uh, people issues come into legislation. It can be anything that you decide. But it is your ability to deliver value through whatever limited expertise that you have. And that is one of the primary reasons why Dexterity focuses as we create these young leaders on career development on one end and leadership development on the other. Because if we are building these young leaders bottom up in our country, they need to be young people who one, have gained the expertise and two, can actually contribute through whatever their areas of interest or whatever their area of domain expertise is. So that is essentially what is happening within the dexterity system. We talk about a word called servant leadership. Servant leadership is something that, you know, Swamiji talked about, dasa siya dasa, servant of servants, is essentially, you know, the concept we try and ask our young people to, you know, explore further and see how they fit into the systems where they have decision-making roles, where they have roles where they can contribute actively, or they are in a position of consequence. And there are three generations of servant leaders that I want to talk to you about. Just yesterday, we celebrated our 75th year of independence, 76th Independence Day. 75 years of our independence, we, in any country's history, we do give special mention and special emphasis to those leaders who walked that country to freedom. For America, that might be July 4, 1776. For us, it is August 15, 1947. But that generation that got us freedom, those people can be called leaders. And if you look at that entire generation, Swamiji's impact is indelible. It is felt in everything that you pick up from that time. Rabindranath Tagore says that if you want to un understand India, read Vivekananda, everything about him is positive, nothing negative. Mahatma Gandhi says that my love for India grew a thousandfold when I read Vivekananda for the first time. Uh, Pandit Nehru calls him the fountainhead of inspiration. Netaji Subhashan Bose says if Swami Vivekananda was alive today, I would have been sitting at his feet doing his work for the rest of my life. These are just some statements that kind of begin to show how the initial impact or how the initial love or that call for nation building, that call for walking to independence, that call for marching to freedom, that was instigated, that instilled, ignited or kindled within some of our greatest leaders by Swamiji's message, by Swamiji's life and Swamiji's work. But that first generation that, you know, did the important work and between 1897, a point when Swamiji is asked, when are we going to get freedom? And he says in 50 years time. In those 50 years time between 1897 and 1947, we see that generation. But there's one huge disservice that we do to our college students and school students across this country. When we talk about Mahatma Gandhi, we limit him to, you know, his uh, spectacles and his walking stick. The symbolism is too high and the detail is too little. We have to tell our young people, what was Mahatma Gandhi doing when he was at your age, in his teens and twenties? When we talk about Ambedkar, we talk about a poor kid who gave to our country the constitution. We, when we talk about Sardar Patel, we link him to iron and we stop right there. When we talk about Nehru, it is about the sobriquet of Chacha and a rose that would be finally placed on his coat suit. 
We do not tell our young people what were these leaders doing when they were in their teens and 20s. And that is essentially a dexterity we very seriously, you know, as young as the kid might be, that's a conversation we uh, start with them. When Mahatma Gandhi was around your age, he was studying at a place called University College London, which was one of the top five universities in the world then and remains today. When Nehru was your age, he was studying at a place called Cambridge. Ambedkar was at a place called Columbia University, where he went on a scholarship that he received from Maharaja Sayaji Rao Gaikwad of Baroda, who was inspired by Swamiji. And uh, Sazar Patel was at a place called Middle Temple in the United Kingdom. The essential fact is that without education, none of these journeys could have been complete. But it was not just, you know, education alone as we see it. Else, there was an entire generation that went to UCL or Cambridge or Columbia, but the Ambedkar or the Nehru or the Gandhi or the Patel, uh, they were singular almost. And that is that these leaders did not just, you know, get the best kind of education that would give them a worldview, a perspective, and brush shoulders with, you know, their contemporaries from the rest of the world, but they traveled across this country. We say Siksha Seva and Samvad. <laughs> Education that was rooted in service and service that found meaning and purpose through conversations. Going among people, having conversations with them, understanding the real pains and real promises and real opportunities and strengths well within this country. And that is essentially, you know, a message we can take from Swamiji's life. I think uh, French Nobel laureate Roma Rola talks about it, that Swamiji could be in a palace one day talking to a king and in a hut or in slums the other day talking to the poor people of this country. And that is in essence something that we do need to see that what kind of leadership we want to offer. A leadership that allows us to deliver value through our expertise and, and, and a leadership that is rooted in service that finds meaning and purpose and gateways and pathways through communication, talking to people and really understanding. Now, many of you would want to become entrepreneurs in the future. What you talk about as market research is essentially going out and asking people if there existed a product that did this for you, uh, would you buy it? And how much would you buy it for? So essentially, these conversations are extremely important parts of our education at the same time. When we look at that generation, of course, it walked us to freedom. But in 1947, we lived in a country which faced the threats of, you know, encroachment from China or, you know, attack from Pakistan or bullying from Soviet Russia or the United States. Our national security, our own integrity, all those things could have been at stake. Uh, we lived in a country where we had a growing population and we did not have enough milk to feed the country. We did not have enough grains to feed our country. And then you see that generation of young leaders return to uh, this great motherland. In 1947-48, a young gentleman with a bachelor's degree and a PhD uh, from University of Cambridge returns to India, meets with the prime minister and says that space should not just be the fortress of Soviet Russia and United States, India can be a player in space. And a young Vikram Sarabhai goes on to build India's space program on one end to a degree that today, our space missions are carried out for a quarter of the budget that Hollywood assigns for a movie that would, depict, that would depict the same. On the other end, a great, great gentleman in Vikram Sarabhai did not just build a space program in this country, but also India's greatest management program, playing a founding role in IIM Ahmedabad and AMA, which is the Ahmedabad Management Association. When we look at Green's Time magazine at the end of 20th, 20th century looked at the 20 most influential Asians of uh, the 20th century and they came up with three Indians on that list. One was Mahatma Gandhi, the other was Rabindranath Tagore, the third one was M.S. Swaminath, who put his education to use, heralded a green revolution in this country. And India today, I know we still have uh, young citizens in our country who die because of the lack of, you know, uh, access to grain, because of starvation, yet the Food Corporation of India in our country has six times the grains that the country needs in its own stocks. That is the level to which India became grain independent. In 1948, we were a milk deficient country. And a young dairy technologist from Michigan State University returned to India, went to a sleepy town in Gujarat called Anand, met with a gentleman by the name of Tribhuvan Das Patel, and together they set out on a billion liter idea. And in 1998, after having worked with nine Indian prime ministers back to back, this young gentleman, through what we, you and I know as Amul, 
turned India in 1998 into the largest producer of milk in the world, overtaking the same United States of America that Dr. Kurian had left and returned from in 1948. Now, same with, you know, the education of a young child growing up in the coastal town, the holy city of Rameshwaram, who would go on to be, you know, from Kalam to Missile Man Kalam to President Kalam and would really uh, spearhead uh, much of our research and uh, defense work in our own country. That essentially is what leadership looks like. Way too many of us make leadership synonymous with political leadership and thus I get to speak, you know, in public maidans in our country to kids in high schools and young people like you in colleges and many times to, you know, bankers and professionals. And I oftentimes ask young people, especially those who are in high schools, those who are in remote towns and uh, small villages of our country, how many of you want to become netas? And barely a hand goes up and if a hand goes up, everybody else giggles because we know what all too well what neta means to us today. And then when the same question is asked in English, how many of you want to become leaders, a few more hands go, go up. But when young people are told that leadership is what your mother does in the house or in her office, when she makes sure she's an active contributor to the entire family and is useful in every moment to every member of that family. And that essentially is servant leadership. Many young people begin to figure out that I'm a leader too. And that message our young kids need to carry from a young age. Somebody can, you know, be uh, sweeping the library floor uh, in school and that can, you know, go on to be, uh, you know, a plantation project when that kid enters college, uh, working with, you know, communities nearby as they grow older and eventually seeing where their innovation can land them. But that is essentially the leadership uh, we talk about. A couple of uh, recent stories that you must have seen, I think, in last uh, five, six months, there was a young girl uh, from Tirupur in Tamil Nadu, uh, who went to University of Chicago. Uh, in fact, she flies this week. All of them fly this week. But in December, a young girl from Tirupur in Tamil Nadu, a daughter of a small farming family uh, who had never taken a train out of Tirupur in her life. She's going to University of Chicago to study on a full scholarship worth three crores. And uh, when this young girl, uh, you know, last year I spent at Harvard, and uh, I had the great fortune of being elected the first Indian president of uh, the student government there. And uh, a few media people wanted to talk to me. Uh, so they were interviewing me and I was sitting in my room. Thanks to Zoom, you can do all these interviews much simpler now. So I was doing this interview. And if any of you have ever seen me on Konbanega Karurpati, you might have seen a Swami Vivekananda portrait right behind me. So for this, uh, I think they were in frame, the anchors. So they were asking questions. So my frame was slim enough. So Swamiji was not visible. So, uh, you know, first, second or third question the interviewer asked me was, uh, you come from a very humble background. How do you decide one day all of a sudden that I'm going to, you know, uh, go to Harvard and run to be the president of the student government? Uh, what has been behind you? What has been driving you? So I just dodged and I showed Swamiji's portrait saying Swamiji has been behind me all life and he's been guiding me. Only to my surprise and not surprise, that when this young girl uh, who became a national sensation when she got accepted to U Chicago, the only kid going on a full ride uh, for her bachelor's degree in medicine, she, you know, when she was being interviewed, she, she had an A4 size uh, picture, same picture of Swamiji pasted behind her and she was doing her interviews. I saw that from Boston. Uh, just a couple of months back, a young kid who you might have seen uh, in news or on social media, because even Rajnikanth versus CID jokes, uh, they were running his uh, news, which was great. Uh, son of a daily wage earner, father earns 200 rupees a day when he earns uh, 200 rupees a day. And uh, he lives in a hut, four feet uh, walls. And in fact, the best representation of it an anchor did, I almost took offense where he was of course trying to show the condition. The anchor was saying, the house this kid lives in, you and I will never enter this house, which is something terrible to say. But he was essentially trying to show that where the kid is coming from. Uh, the kid is going uh, to a top school in the United States on a full scholarship. And um, at this point, when, you know, the media people went into his uh, house, the three books that were uh, kept there, they asked him to, you know, pick up a book and read from it. Uh, one book, all three books were Swamiji books. 
and uh, he you know was reading from one book and they were taking their bite and shots whatever they want uh, the reason why i tell you you know these couple of stories a girl from tirupur in tamil nadu had never taken a train out of uh, her uh, small town and a kid who you know is the son of a daily wage earner and is now you know going on a full scholarship to study and swami ji is uh, you know role in uh, their lives it is because most of these kids come from remote towns and villages and nobody nobody in their family in this generation or maybe even five generations later could have dreamt of something like this and then imagine where do these kids get their confidence or faith from and it is swami ji's life message and call each one of the three separately that infuse so much confidence and faith and that commitment to do something for our country when we look at swami ji's life he faced not one obstacle but way too many we talk about uh, september 11 when he spoke in chicago and he was an almost runaway global rock star and sensation and people were writing about him and everybody wanted him to come and talk but right before that swami ji was you know he had lost the address he was finding it miserable where to stay where to eat all kinds of challenges swami ji overcame and not for a single moment does he you know uh, decide to give up and that is you know a message we can take from swami ji's life if we want to be young leaders that in the face of adversity we have to choose hope and strength and that is essentially what swami ji does all his life despite all personal challenges despite all kinds of challenges that are there the second thing is as young leaders in our country and around the world you'll always have the option of choosing a story for yourself and what we learn from swami ji's life is about choosing the better story When Swami ji went to speak, you know, in Chicago, the red fort did not have the Indian tri- tricolor on it. In fact, we could not even carry out a procession with uh, the Indian tricolor. And yet Swami ji could have, you know, gone and he could have said something like that, you know, I come from a poor country, I come from a country that is a British colony, English is not my first language, this country is too cold, I'm out of here. But he didn't say that. He chose the better story. he chose the great story of our great culture and civilization he chose what india could offer to the world what india had offered to the world in the longest period of time and that option we have every single day many of us you know we come across an assignment or a study material or whatever it is and many times we want to kind of give up uh, before we even start saying this is too hard to learn i'm going to take a look at it the night before the exam but the message we need to carry with ourselves is and this is what we talk to our young people at dexterity all the time we are lifelong learners swami vivekananda talks about his guru shri ramkrishna dev that he was a lifelong learner when we give ourselves when we choose that story about ourselves of being you know lifelong learners we are reminded of the fact that when we did not know you know a language we picked up a language when uh, we walked into playgrounds or you know sat at our table and our friends were playing games within a few seconds or minutes we picked up the rules of the game we've learned you know a few subjects a few rules and a few uh, syntaxes here and there and we are lifelong learners sometimes it might take a little more time than other times but essentially inherently we are lifelong learners and we need to remain lifelong learners if we want to be leaders in any field uh, whatsoever it might be in the world The second part of choosing that better story is being lifelong leaders. All of us are lifelong leaders. When we didn't know a language even before we picked up a new language. If we were sick we could get our mother's attention if we wanted food we could get the attention of people in the family that we needed food. When we were you know 1 year old or 2 years old. Lifelong in adversity we respond. There's a wonderful TED talk of Rohit Deshpande a professor at Harvard Business School that some of you might have come across where he talks about 2611 and how in 2611 the staff working at Taj show something that is inherently human that in moments of crisis human beings are undertake the most heroic deeds putting themselves behind and putting everybody else ahead they say that at Taj the people who were attending banquet that night 2611 that fateful uh, night of the attack nobody who was in the banquet was actually hurt or injured or shot dead when the young people who were wor- working as banquet managers at taj hotel that evening when they heard that the hotel was under attack these were 25 26 year old young men and women who were in charge of these events that were happening for companies like unilever the young people responded with utter calm when they heard this and then they, they just put the lights off and requested all guests to you know just hide under tables for some time just crouch down 
The chefs, when they realized that now evacuation can take place, they saw that the corridors of Taj were places from where terrorists could storm in. And they decided to form human chains, blocking every corridor as much as they could with the broad shoulders that they had. And they just asked guests to run through that human chain. And the only bullets that actually were taken were taken by the chefs who were supposed to cook at Hotel Taj, not run a rescue operation. Those were the people who, by the way, lost their lives. The third set of people working at Hotel, Hotel Taj that day were the young women in customer care. And they were told that the hotel is under attack, please leave. Don't be at near your phones. And they said, if the hotel is under attack, this is the place where you know the bell is going to ring the most. We cannot leave our international families and national families who will be calling to ask for the welfare of our people. We're going to stay here till everything is safe. Those women did not leave till it was, you know, 4 a.m., 5 a.m. And things were, you know, uh, progressing as, uh, you know, the security personnel wanted it. Rohit Deshpande does a, a wonderful, wonderful analysis of where does this come from? And they talk about recruiting, of course, rec the kind of people that Tatas go on to recruit. But most importantly, what he does conclude is that in moments of crisis, we are inherently heroic. We are inherently people who put, you know, others first. That is essentially what servant leadership is. But the first part of Swamiji overcoming obstacles to achieve, you know, what might be considered the impossible, that's an important lesson of leadership we must take from Swamiji's life. The second lesson that we must take from Swamiji's life is choosing the better story. And those two stories as young citizens of this country that we must choose every day is us being lifelong learners and us being lifelong leaders. The third message that we take from Swamiji's life continuously is that us alone may not be able to you know, change everything. Building organizations that are of value, are, are of importance, that is something that many of us should be thinking about. I'm glad that you talked about entrepreneurship for society. And as innovators, as technologists, as pioneers in different fields as you will be or might be already, it is important to build organizations that can sustain that innovation, that can take it forward. And essentially, I, we might be running short of time, so that's why I'm uh, going to conclude and open it up for questions soon enough. It is important that as we look at Swamiji's life, we look at his call, we look at his message. Swamiji talks about, you know, India leading the world. He talks about the future of India being so glorious that even the past of India would not be a match for it. But he also talks about, you know, my faith lies in the younger generation, the modern generation. He says, out of them will come my workers and they'll work out this whole problem like lions. We have to be that generation for our country. We have to put more kids through school. We have to make our hospitals work for everybody. We have to make sure that things like agriculture and economy and anything that we talk about, it makes as much sense to an old person in a remote town of our country as it does to a very tech savvy, pragmatic young citizen in a metropolitan. And this is not easy work, but that is the reason why we send a generation to school. And that is the reason why we send a generation to college. Oftentimes, never having that conversation with them. Why do we send a generation to school? Why do we send a generation to college? That is essentially the conversation we are having at Dexterity. That is essentially the reason why we are preparing those workers and leaders that Swamiji talked about. Many of them will go on to be entrepreneurs, many doctors, many engineers, many journalists, many writers, many organization builders. And the reason why we see it as important work is because if we are expecting that, you know, Technology alone will solve all the problems. It may happen to a great degree, but there's more work to be done in that. If we think that, you know, we want to become entrepreneurs, but not because we've seen the pain of a person and we want to solve that pain point, but because we've seen Elon Musk on the front of a magazine or a social media uh, meme and we want to be that person now, uh, then we are running into trouble. Uh, something about entrepreneurship that I do want to add because I was uh, way too young to understand what I was doing was enterprising. Uh, but I've been way too fortunate to be recognized as an entrepreneur in different places from the White House to the Nobel Prize ceremony. And there's something about entrepreneurship that I hope that your, this lecture hall for, at IIT Kanpur, there's a conversation you can take forward. Nobody who we see as rich, powerful or influential actually wanted to be rich, powerful or influential. Paul Allen and Bill Gates looked at 
uh, the front cover of a magazine that had a computer on it and they felt people who run this computer will run the world, that software one day will be running the world. From the reception desk at a hospital to a classroom in school to, you know, a research facility, they felt software will be running the world. And that is exactly what they set out to do. And while we love Bill Gates 2.0, his Gates Foundation role for, you know, how much he changed the world through that, Bill Gates 1.0 changed the world as well. And it was by expanding human productivity by hundreds of trillions of dollars, by inventing something that would make humans more useful, more productive. When we look at Steve Jobs, there's a straight up statement that Bill Gates quotes about Steve Jobs saying that the world is a richer place today uh, because Steve chose not to be the richest person at his own funeral. He had a simple idea that, you know, software and hardware will, should seamlessly integrate that technology devices that Apple should make should be like bicycle for the mind. And he did a good enough job at it, and you see what uh, followed. We look at Mark Zuckerberg, and I know the movie Social Network wants us uh, to believe a few things a uh, little more than others, but the kid built something called Zucknet at home to communicate with the Zuckerberg family. Uh, the sisters and the kids in the family would communicate using that, and wanted to build something where everybody uh, could, you know, uh, exchange uh, text, messages, pictures, eventually files, the World Wide Web within uh, a social media and uh, you know how so ever successful he has been in doing that but all these people who we look at were essentially deeply passionate about something or thought that this one thing could you know solve a lot of problems or offer a wide range of solutions since they did it for billions of people they went on to become billionaires and that is something that I think that is a clarity we all need in our lives and when young people come into the dexterity system and we talk to them, you know, throughout. Uh, there's something called Dexterity 10 that every single kid within the Dexterity system, you know, goes through uh, and, you know, tries to uh, walk the path off. We talk about four key skills, critical thinking, research, communication, and leadership. Two core values of empathy and fearlessness. Two core commitments of public service and nation building. And finally, we say driven by a scientific temperament and grounded in spiritual values. When we talk to our young people about Dexterity 10, when they come into their residential training many times, when we begin talking about entrepreneurship, we talk about three things. The first thing we say is money is not a bad thing. To quote Warren Buffett on that point, he says money is a good way to keep score. If you're creating something of value, it's a good way to keep score. So many of us, you know, when we look at something that we are doing, we begin to get very averse to money. Oh, no, no. If money comes in, it's a bad thing. No. If you create something of value, good enough if the money comes in. The second thing we tell them is business is a good thing, which essentially means many times when people are, you know, not doing their jobs, we say, mind your own business. That means business must be a good thing and owning one or running one might be even better. So if you are able to build something of value, a technology that, you know, makes healthcare or agriculture or education or even financial markets better, whatever it is, you are, you know, delivering a product, information, or service uh, to the world that is of value. The third thing we say, and that is important for all of us in this room as uh, young leaders, we say even change needs a business model. Way too many of us overlook the Indian independence movement in terms of its fundraising, where, you know, all the money had to be brought in, the crowdsourcing, the uh, bootstrapping, everything that went in to, you know, walk to freedom's cause at one point. So, essentially, the third generation of servant leaders that I'm talking about is this generation right here. 75 years, 70 years, and this is the phase in which we are beginning to see what our next 25 years will look like. And this is a point in time when India needs that next generation of servant leaders. And something that all of us need to keep in mind because, you know, we talk about specialists and uh, generalists and a lot of those things. There's something phenomenal that I saw about Swamiji growing up, and that is where I'll pause. Uh, two years ago, I was speaking at a conference, at a seminar uh, called Indian Ethos for Modern Management. And one uh, senior monk of the order, uh, Swami Shuddhidananji Maharaj, was, uh, you know, going from Ahmedabad to Rajkot. Uh, we were in the same car. And Maharaj asked me a very good question, which really made me think. He said, you talk about, you know, reading Swamiji at a young age. What was Swamiji like to you when you were reading him at a young age? What was your image of Swamiji? And I thought for a few seconds and I said, Maharaj, Swamiji to me was a superhero because I grew up without a television. My friends, you know, talked about superheroes. Swamiji was an absolute superhero. 
when there was darkness and people were giving up hope he you know came in really waking india from the deep slumber as he would call it when he goes to you know chicago and what he does is heroic what he you know the plan that he takes the campaign he takes up for india that is heroic everything that swami ji did was heroic for me then the second thing that i saw from swami ji's life was the impact he had on people from different walks of lives we know about the speech in chicago and we forget that swami ji at the world fair where the pa world parliament of religions took place in chicago was having ice cream with nikola tesla uh, they say that nikola tesla was heavily uh, inspired by swami ji when we look at you know uh, people right here at home sister nivedita swami vivekananda inspired you know uh, people uh, ranging from uh, abhinandan tagore who made the first picture of bharat mata to you know uh, jagdishan bose and everybody else uh, in this country from the field of sciences to you know education to uh, you know just nation building patriotism not just that the tatas invite swami ji to come in and lead the tatas and he in his response uh, writes a letter that would lead to the founding of uh, two fortresses of research in our country the tata institute of fundamental research tifr and indian institute of science bangalore iisc so we essentially look at swami ji's life and we understand he was only 29 years of age uh, if i am not wrong when he spoke in chicago all of 39 when he decided to leave his body and uh, could easily proclaim that his work would continue for 1500 years now not many of us in fact none of us are going to be alive in body uh, in the next 1500 years but these next 80 years that almost all of us have uh, you know in stock those of you who want to talk about 90 or 100 i can give you that because i heard president kalam one time uh, in my hometown and he was talking about one kid from the auditorium going to moon so he said okay you guys must be 12 13 or 14 so by the time you are uh, 44 you'll go to moon Uh, I'll be 113 then. <laughs> so he very happily, positively said that. But on uh, that note, I would want to end. But this has been, you know, a very patient listening session. I want to end with a small story, unrelated to dexterity, unrelated to Swami Ji, uh, from my hometown. Uh, all of you must have heard of you know anganwadi centers in our country they take care of kids uh, who you know their health their little bit of learning it is taken care of so a 3 year old child or 4 year old child went to an anganwadi center for the first time they took his weight they gave him something to eat he played a few games he came back that evening so the child was asked at home parents asked him how was your day good uh, did you like everything yes will you go tomorrow no why will you not go a 4 year old child he said today they have taken my weight tomorrow they will sell me <laughs> <laughs> now <laughs> when you think of the reason why the child said that is likely because you know growing up in a remote town he's been carried in you know the mother's lap or the father's lap they go to a shop to buy anything right they first wait then they sell it grains salt sugar they wait they sell it so the first time the kid they weighed him of course kept quiet went through the rest of the day was probably waiting to be sold but made home safe so decided good enough tomorrow i'm not going but see this is a 3 4 year old child maybe he's going to make it to an iit one day but even if he doesn't he's not an iit and he can figure out looking around from patterns observing all the time and really you know processing things around him the kid might be wrong this one time but this is what my request to all of you is there's a great call that swami ji has given india must lead the world and we shall have no doubts about it we must contribute to that cause swami ji talked about 100 people given on our based on our population today we might need 10000 or even 1 million we should try and be one of those 10000 or 1 million workers of swami ji not just a few thousand who make it by and that is you know a bigger call that is a bigger entrance exam that all of us must write be swami ji's workers and as we do that let's continue to observe let's continue to process let's continue to look at patterns in our society as well not just you know algorithms and numbers but those patterns in our society what keeps a child from you know going to school or getting a good job or starting something of his or her own or a farmer from you know getting the kind of crops the person would want and in all of that thinking like the child you might avoid getting sold 
sold to you know Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan. Great institutions, great institutions. You should go. But at the same time, there's a lot that the country can buy in if you put forward. And that buying in can be, you know, in fundamental things that will contribute to nation building in a major way, like a Swaminathan or Sridharan or Sarabhai or Kalam did, uh, inspired by that generation that came before them, inspired by the call of Swamiji that lies ahead of us. Thank you very much. We'll open it up for questions. Could you say something more about the exchange? Where it is located? Do you have your office? How do you operate? Ji Maharaj. Uh, so, Dexterity, we are, uh, if we can use the word, headquartered uh, in Patna and uh, it's a very interesting organization. Nobody who works at Dexterity has not come out of the Dexterity system except for me. So the joke within the organization is I am the only non-Dexter uh, within the organization. So all these young people, they went on to you know, study at top uh, universities across the world on full scholarships, they came back, they became full-timers within the organization. So five to eight of us who are full timers and then what we essentially do is you can, uh, you know, go take a look at dexterityglobal.org. Uh, we have seven different platforms at this point. The three, diff three platforms that uh, are, you know, of immediate value in terms of explaining it. One is opportunities, discovery and preparation platform. On the first Sunday of every month, individuals or institutions receive the opportunity update and these opportunities can be you know scholarships, competitions, conferences, workshops and not just that we also understand that many kids might have never written an essay in their life and might not have anybody in the family, a teacher or a parent who can help them write a good essay. So if New York Times is doing you know an essay writing competition or Hindustan Times is doing that competition, with every opportunity there are two preparation resources. So their preparation, preparation resource for you know an essay competition will be something like how to structure an argument, how to you know uh, structure an essay something like that. So that is the opportunity discovery and preparation platform. The second one uh, is the leadership development program where we identify 80 young kids from different parts of our country. They now come from uh, almost 22 states of our country and we train them rigorously throughout the year and then finally they come in residence where their training happens. To your surprise and to mine, this year climate uh, there was a competition that was uh, organized, uh, Climate Champions 2022. In the finals, in the final run-up, there were six teams, IIT Bombay, HEC Paris, HKUST, Imperial College London, London School of Economics, and the sixth team was a team of high school kids from Dexterity. Others were business school and policy school kids. Guess who are headed to the UNESCO headquarters this November in uh, Paris to receive the winning amount, that is 7,500 euros every candidate of the five-member team. It is the Dexterity High School kids. They so when we talk about learning to learn and learning to lead, absolutely phenomenal rigor that these young people follow. And uh, nobody like me or a senior leader within the organization even came to mentor or handhold them. They, one outside advice they took, it was the climate championship this year was, you know, coming up with a business idea to solve a climate uh, related problem. And since they had to do financials as well, they reached out to one more dexterity kid who was not a part of the team and asked him to look at, you know, the numbers that they had done for, you know, how much it would cost and other things. But uh, that is a leadership development program. Uh, this year, the graduation speaker at the leadership development program, if it now adds any value, uh, was the Nobel Prize winner for 2019 in economics, uh, Professor Abhijit Banerjee. The year before that, it was Bharat Ratna CNR Rao. But I can tell you without a doubt, Till four years, five years, six years back, even the dog walking down the street, if we asked him to come in and do a special bark, the person would not do it. Uh, so uh, today we have, you know, around 500 young leaders who have come out of uh, Dex School, Dexterity School of Leadership and Entrepreneurship, who are doing phenomenal things. In last 14 years, 11 regional ambassadors to the United Nations have come from the Dexterity Network. In last 14 years, 11 of them. And uh, then the third part is called career development program. Because uh, when a kid is nine to 13 years of age and is being exposed to all these opportunities, is participating, comes in, gets trained within the leadership development program, rises as a local role model. Then many of them, you know, by the time they're 17 or 18, they want to, you know, study economics or public policy or mechanical engineering at, you know, a higher level at one of the best universities in the world. What is good about top 500 universities in the world is that while selection is extremely challenging for undergraduate studies especially, 
If you get in, you get a full scholarship. That makes life easier for us because many of our kids cannot even take out a bank loan. So these kids, you know, go ahead to apply. That is where this year, now all put together, they've received over 113 crores in scholarships. Uh, some of them have gone this summer, worked at JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, both, uh, which we love. There is no issue with that. And uh, But it is essentially that. During COVID, we built a program called Young Professionals Development Program, which started as the 1,000 internships program. And young people from IITs, SRCC, all different institutions, they come in, they spend the summer within the dexterity system, then they go out, they continue doing their work. But uh, these are things that are you know happening within the dexterity space. Uh, residential training is over the summer because we realized schools took away the morning, coaching took away the evening. So we took off the summer break and winter break. So that is where, you know, the residential training happens. But that is a little bit about dexterity management. Uh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, starting out, I think the singular problem that I did face was I was 16 years old who wanted to talk a little bit about education how it should be and why it's not working sort of. And when you're 16, even your own school principal does not want to hear from you uh, how your school should be run. I was a 16 year old who was trying to go and talk to other school principals about what can be done. So those who heard uh, uh, me out uh, were very kind, but that also led to the foundation of something at Dexterity, which we call direct to student model, as opposed to direct to school model because it was a major challenge uh, going to schools and convincing them, government schools or private schools, of you know, bringing their kids into the main fold of these opportunities. Uh, you know, many of the Olympiads that you might have written, not the uh, INMO or those, the SOF Olympiads, National Science Olympiads, Cyber Olympiad, those, or many other competitions that take place, unfortunately or fortunately, have a small commission that goes to the school. Dexterity had none of that. So if you pay 100 rupees as entry fees for an Olympiad, the school gets 25 rupees for, you know, organizing it. At Dexterity, we didn't have anything like that. So it was very challenging. So we built a direct to uh, student model. And the second thing was, you know, we had no money. And uh, we had no backers. Not, you know, just angels and VCs. No backers like that, but also people who believed something could be done. So we, uh, there's a photocopy shop it used to be, you know, a stone's throw from my house. We had run into 80,000 rupees in debt uh, at that shop. But the photocopy person, he believed in me a lot. And uh, many times he would also give us cash. This 80,000 rupees was not just, you know, printouts. It was also cash that he would give from time to time. So later on, you know, when we were repaying that and other things, uh, he would say that, I knew that you were going to do well. Because many times I would go for, you know, if I went to Japan or Korea, I would go for a scanning of that news article or a photocopy of that news article. So he was reading those things too. So he said, no, no, I used to see those things. I knew that something will happen. So I said, no, no, the other, <laughs> the different story is one time I was at the photocopy shop and every day a Panditji used to come in to do Aarti. So he looked at me and he said, this kid will go far. <laughs> That's why you do it. But uh, overall, uh, a lot of people, you know, around us supported. It also helped us really innovate how to do things. Uh, we wanted a venue and we were like, how do we get a venue? So we decided we go to a university campus. Over the summer, they have nobody at the university, but they have classrooms, they have a cafeteria, they have, you know, a place for kids to stay. Can they give it to us on a subsidized rate or maybe even for free? So those ways, you know, we changed a lot of things and it really helped us do a lot more with very little money. Yes. Please. I just wanted to ask, like, what, what is your comment about the disconnection of the society and the IITs? Because I generally feel like we are highly disconnected from the uh, society. Uh, that's a very good question. When I was picked and I was on my way to the institution, I actually asked uh, Akash, uh, wherever you are. So I asked Akash that, you know, what is in IIT Kanpur's locality? So he said some village. I said, what is your relationship with that village? So he said, I don't know yet, but I think that relationship should be built uh, where you go and spend some time. And I think there's a, a great quote that is, you know, uh, some social workers who have spent their lifetime, they're old now, uh, at their place, they have put it out where they say, go not to teach, but to learn, go, go not to help, but to be helped. 
Many times we go in with this mindset, we want to give, we want to give, we want to give. There's a lot more to take in. And once you've taken in, that is when you know you can really engage. Uh, having said that, uh, I think to a fair degree I agree that in India whatever is said, the opposite can also be true. I know that you know there might be IITs where you know there's a good connect with uh, the locality or society in general and there have been so many IITs who have built organizations and companies and institutions that have created so much value for our country. So that does exist but the best way is I think you know beginning with uh, your own locality and seeing what more can be done. It can go from you know rainwater harvesting to helping them solve uh, numericals at a young age. It can be at any uh, range uh, or domain. So that's something to think of. But it is about really integrating in local communities. And that also means you know when you take the bus back, when you take the flight back or the train back home, talk to people. Talk to as many people as you can. Uh, that opens uh, up our thought process like uh, nothing. My question. So my question is that sometimes uh, allegations are being put upon the largest educational institutions like IIM and IITs that in the journey of uplifting uh, the intellect of the country, uh, like they have inculcated so much uh, like type of materialism that uh, many uh, the value system has declined a lot. So my question to you is that do you see uh, any difference between the today's concept of uh, taking your work as passion and uh, the concept of karma yoga, which is uh, explained in uh, uh, there's a lot that I can say, but uh, the one sentence I want to say is that's why, you know, uh, bodies like Vivekananda Samiti are important on college campuses. At least it begins, you know, one conversation changes the classroom. So at least conversations begin. Uh, is there a hard stop for me? What time do we uh, stop? We can go to it. Okay, at least till 8 we have, right? Okay. Uh, so I want to see whether or not. I want to uh, share this uh, story, but there's a wonderful uh, story that Swamiji uh, has about a monkey who was, uh, have, have all of you heard it? The one thing is you can go and, uh, you know, uh, read it. The second is I can uh, give you the version of it where there's a monkey who's uh, uh, very thirsty. Uh, Swamiji, hope you'll forgive me if I adapt it a little bit. But uh, Swamiji talks about this story in the West, and this is for all of us here in this room, that uh, there was a monkey who was very thirsty and he decided to go and, you know, open up a water tap. But uh, he heard a hissing sound. So restless by nature, he, you know, just uh, closed the tap, thought a snake is going to come out of it. Okay? Then he went and he sat under a tree and he found a bottle. Uh, with something in it, content unknown, and he drank the full bottle. Uh, that is where essentially after some time he realized within uh, moments that it was a bottle full of liquor. So now this restless monkey uh, is also drunk. So this monkey starts, you know, kind of moving around a little bit and a scorpion comes out of the tree and bites him in his, uh, on his tail. And now the monkey is in deep pain, okay, uh, stung by this scorpion. And as a monkey is now jumping and uh, restless and directionless and in pain under this tree, a ghost comes down and possesses the monkey. So Swamiji talks about, you know, uh, this monkey as a human mind, uh, restless by nature as the monkey is, uh, directionless after a bottle of wine, which is a bottle of desire essentially, uh, stung by a, uh, in deep pain because of the, because uh, the monkey gets stung by a scorpion, which is the sting of jealousy and uh, then possessed by the ghost of ego and it is a very simple thing that many of us you know we want something and we are restless and right before something good is about to come out water is about to come out we think oh a snake will come out and we just you know change the way the second thing is many times uh, we might be fine with a bottle of water or a cup of water even if it was wine if he had a cup of it he might have been okay i don't know people who are experienced can tell but uh, the <laughs> monkey drinks the entire bottle so that is a bottle of desire where, and this is unnecessary desire, goals should be there, targets should be there. It's not saying don't have a short term target or a long term target or a meaningful target. This is, you know, just useless desire. I want a big car, I want a big house, X, Y, Z, or like I want a plus one, plus one. So that bottle of desire gets you, you know, directionless at, at a particular point in time. The sting of the scorpion, Swamiji says, is the sting of jealousy. Now you took a big car, but you realize somebody who went to IIT Kanpur with you now has a bigger car. That is more painful than, you know, working for that car in the first place. 
So that sting of jealousy, you get a great pay package, parents are happy, everybody is happy. Just the next day you figure out the same kid who lived in the same dorm as you now has a slightly better pay package. So that sting of jealousy is not good. And then the final part is, but now you refuse that offer and you take up a better offer, which is, you know, better than what your roommate got. That is when you get possessed by the ghost of ego. And that is something that if, you know, if it was written down outside every management and te technology institution in our country, and when kids walked in, they read about this one monkey as well, uh, it would, you know, change a lot of lives. Like Gandhiji is three monkeys, Swamiji is one monkey, I think can uh, change a lot of lives. It did, it did, you know, in the West, it has uh, changed many uh, lives. Having said that, I think the problem lies in three to four questions. First is never asking our young people, why do we send them to school? Never asking them, why do we send you to college? And I don't blame the kids for that because they get a clear message from newspapers and magazines that we go to 10th grade in order to get good marks so that we go to a good institution for 12th grade. We go into 12th grade to, you know, write an entrance, get into IIT, we go to IIT to get a good pay package, X, Y, Z. I'm not speaking for everybody here, so nobody should feel hurt if, you know, no, I want to do something else. This is just a hyper generalized, but yet hyper popular notion. The other two questions that are very important to ask is, why am I doing this in the first place? And many of you who want to be entrepreneurs, it's not going to be easy running something more than six months or three years or five years. Startup mortality rate, as many of you already know, is north of 95%. Some would even say 98, 99%. Most startups die within that time period. It is not because they run out of money or their marketing went wrong. It is just because somebody started out to be rich, powerful, powerful and influential quick enough and realized this was not their baby. They were not going to you know, continue with it long enough. That's why you're going to have tough and challenging days, whether you do whatever you choose to do. And the two questions you should be able to ask yourself is, why am I doing it in the first place? And if you've answered that question well enough, the three years, five years, 10 years down the line, even on the deepest, deepest night, when you see no morning to it, you'll be able to ask yourself the fourth question. And that is, why did I start in the first place? And if that visual is very clear to you, why you started in the first place, it will be huge. I had the great honor of, you know, uh, being the team manager of Harvard Hockey when I was there. Hockey there is ice hockey. It is the fastest team sport in the world and it is just uh, phenomenal. Uh, if any of you have watched Chuck Day, you should also uh, watch Miracle. It is a movie about college kids from America beating Soviet military veterans in the 1980 Winter Olympics in the middle of the Cold War. Fascinating movie about management and training and leadership and coaching and whatnot. But I was a team manager for Harvard Hockey and uh, you know, as simple as I, I might be, uh, when it comes to hockey, that humble brag, we were the Ivy League champions and the conference champions. There's something very important about the place where we played. Uh, two kids on my team went on to play in the Olympics. Uh, we had, you know, this, uh, every game would come on ESPN. My jersey was retired on ESPN, which is uh, fun. But when we walked out to play, when you come out of the dugout, as you would know in cricket language, there's a huge wallpaper that we have. And it reads, how hard would you play if you knew today was the last day you were playing hockey? And we all read it. And then we walk out. And there actually comes that one last day when you're playing the last home game of the season. And you see it in the eyes of the kids. They want to play as hard as they can. And there is going to be one, that one last day, you know, when you will, be, you will be here in campus or you will be at an organization or we will be here in this world. And it is very important to be asking ourselves that critical question. That question, unfortunately, has no place in that rat race that many of us uh, get embarked on. So many of you will be local role models again, who will, you know, get those questions uh, brought in, these stories brought in. Yes. So, sir, I, I come from the Latin place, Chapra. I have lived in Chapra. Chapra was the place where I got introduced to uh, my first Ram Krish Mission Ashram. It yes, used sir. to be Adbhutana Lashram then. Yes, sir. I think that in our areas, like uh, we are at uh, Chapla, Sumana, Gopal, and all in India, there is very similar to startups and kind uh, of technology. As you know that many people want to go and do a good book. I am not saying do you want to go for the job and all the things like this. But if you want to get to be a shit or a job and job, to ask people 
that my my language is there so that new innovation culture or startup culture in our area will be all the Shapuda and we are we are sales. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, I think again in this. Uh, I kind of refrain from uh, saying it that does not exist or is not there, but uh, there is a parallel between you know places you are talking about and other places in our country, and uh, there are very practical reasons for it. One, the lack of economic security. A family that is not financially secure does not want the kid you know to dive into the deep end of entrepreneurship on day one. You know once they graduate from college, and we should not be you know uh, pushing them either if we don't give them uh, kind of a cushion. Second thing is, how much of innovation do we encourage our kids to take on ever since you know they turned uh, teenagers? Uh, the likelihood of a child being involved in more innovative exercises uh, between you know zero and and nine is higher than somebody doing it between uh, you know the, those early teenage years because the kid is at least you know breaking a toy. The kid is doing you know two million things that come to the mind. Uh, 13 to 19 learned how to polish his shoes, uh, stay disciplined, comb the hair in a particular way, stand in a line in a particular way. So the second question is how much of room is there to be doing innovative things? Uh, the prism and the rectangular glass slab that you were supposed to do your experiments with, uh, I don't know where those were <laughs> when I was in school. Like you had to write your practical, which is great. Sometimes people with good handwriting had to write the practical. So uh, if you know kids don't get a playing field to begin with. It's uh, not going to happen, you know, in one day. When we talk about local role models, it comes back to this part. One, uh, Pulela Gopichand goes on to, you know, enter world badminton, world juniors in badminton, goes on to win all England badminton championship, comes back from an injury to do it, is the only person to come up back from an injury in the game of badminton and win a uh, win all England championship, goes back and sets up a training academy, and he's winning impacted racket sports across the board and the training academy that he set a 13 year old Sainan Ehwal, a 9 year old PV Sindhu come in, they train, they go on to win as many medals that in the last 70 years you know the sports authority of India uh, did not manage to churn out. So what are two things we are seeing? One local role models, two building a system that you know institutionally encourages this kind of behavior or this kind of practice that also is essentially the Sachin Tendulkar impact. You look at a Sachin Tendulkar in public maidans across the country. Your kids playing cricket, playing cricket, playing cricket. There it's a different matter. Like not everybody might make it to Team India. But where is that cricket taking place for startups in our country? Where are those small places where, you know, continuous churning and innovation is happening for kids at a younger age? So that local role model and that institutional setup where it can happen is important. I know uh, there is Atal Innovation Mission, good tinkering labs, very well. But my message to you would be, uh, you know, they say that uh, when uh, Israel was uh, reclaimed, they said that, okay, we cannot be a country without our people. So all uh, people come back. They invited all Israelis back to uh, the land. So what is essentially important is, uh, they say, you know, go back to your country, go back to your village, go back to your roots, that sort of a conversation. They say it takes a village. Sometimes it takes our own young people to go back to their villages. So when you have your break, go back, visit your high school and tell, you know, your teachers, tell your principals what you see here at IITs, that this can prepare our kids to one, of course, get accepted into IIT, but also thrive there. That conversation needs to begin. So go back to your small towns, go back to districts, go back to villages, go back to your high school and try and in initiate, you know, these conversations. That will have a tremendous, tremendous impact in uh, the kind of culture that we built. At Dexterity, what we feel we have been successful at is when kids leave high school, unless they went to an extremely branded institution, they don't have any kind of, you know, alumni affinity or belong they don't feel they belong to that school. Many want to leave the school as quick as they can by the time they reach 9th or 10th or 11th or 12th. You don't build the next generation when that affinity lacks. You come to IIT, you take a lot of prestige in your brand. That's why, you know, there's a culture of alumni who you'll bump into, you know, in interviews and networking events. That does not happen for your high school, I'm pretty sure. At Dexterity, when we talk about our graduates and fellows, that is a nationwide network we feel is one of our achievements that we've been able to build. 
that a kid who's in you know grade 11th can talk to somebody who just you know uh, entered college and can have a good conversation about it so be those local role models back in your community igniting those conversations and also you know guiding those uh, pathways if needed and i think that will you know uh, bring a decent amount of change but there's good news from bihar good things are happening thank you very much he spoke about he spoke very well he spoke about uh, dexterity dexterity in sanskrit means kaushal yoga karma so kaushal says the bhagavad gita so how you skillfully do things that's the purpose of living a balanced harmonious life yoga so it's very very inspiring that uh, such a thing is happening that kind of initiative he has taken and uh, he's taking it forward you know how much of a struggle is involved to make uh, to build up an organization of this type and that too with uh, such large you know coming up of the uh, money also the general going into international It's all very encouraging. We must uh, give a big hand to Sharad Swarup. Yes. Another aspect of leadership which he has uh, highlighted is that leadership is not about position. It's not about chair. We generally think leader means he should be a man of position somewhere. He sits in his okay. He has a his occupying. particular uh, post or position it is more of qualities more of a character more of your more of your behavior your vision that really makes you leader so he has brought it out very well vivekananda samiti has been doing to spread this idea of swami vivekananda among the iitians here for last 50 years in my uh, humble association with uh, the iit here for last 4 years And then here, about two years with IIT Kharagpur, and about twelve years with IIT Madras. I've always learned many new things in my association through Vivekananda study circles in all these places. So uh, I invite all of you, those who have not ever attended our uh, Saturday morning meditation session, to join us. You always read something from Swami Vivekananda and try to concentrate the mind and try to catch the monkey mind, try to make it calm. So that is one thing. And another thing, he referred to Swami Vivekananda's various uh, teachings. Uh, please take them up. They are very authentic. Uh, take it from the authentic sources. Nine volumes. Complete works of Swami Vivekananda in nine volumes, and you will find that is the you know Sister Nivedita writes. Uh, she wrote it about hundred years back. That she writes as an introduction to the complete works. She says, in future, if any Indian would like to know what is my heritage, what is that authentic? Uh, uh, she uses the word, the great stone to lay my anchor upon. Where is that? Uh, where is that message? Where is that uh, culture? Where is that uh, thought in the civilization that has come? They will turn to these pages of Swami Vivekananda's complete works. So please do read them. Please try to enrich your life along with your studies, along with your uh, research, and that is what the purpose of Vivekananda Swami's activities and the Vivekananda Samadhis, and also. Uh, try to do the kind of some work for us. Last year we were all engaged in cross uh, giving the uh, compels to the needy people. They just pulled in money and did that, or organized a medical camp for the uh, workers working in the camp. That's what I just said. Like the some uh, service activities also. So it will be wonderful if all of you can. Uh, take up both these study and seva, and I also invite you on behalf of the Ram Krishna Mission Kanpur to visit our place, see this.
old ashram which is running since 1936 and uh, we have a temple, we have a small library and a school and other things that since 1936. So I wish uh, the Vivekananda uh, Vivekan Samiti all the best and they carry on their work and let more and more volunteers, more and more people uh, join their activities and uh, such occasions like this as we heard today will be organized in the future and please join them.